School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. For many people, the thought of spending your life next to the aquamarine waters of the Caribbean is an envious one. But for many people in the tiny fishing vi village of Cahio Beach in western Cuba, it's something they only want to escape. Life for them is a constant struggle and filled with many disappointments. Food is hard to come by, children are sent to schools that are often closed, power outages occur regularly, and the aging equipment people depend on for daily life, from mopeds to boat engines to flip-flops, are in constant need of repair. Few have hope for a better life in Cuba, and so the only promise for many is to board a raft or small boat in hopes of making the 90-mile journey to the United States alive. So this glimpse into life in communist Cuba 59 years after Fidel Castro's revolution is depicted in a richly detailed new documentary called Voices of the Sea. Directed by the British-American filmmaker Kim Hopkins, the film screened, screened in March at the True False Film Festival in Columbia, Missouri, and will air in the fall on PBS as part of its POV strand of documentaries. Voices of the Sea tells the story of Cahio Beach and the many disappointments of life in modern Cuba through the lives of four people. There's a fisherman named Pita, who sees himself following in the footsteps of his father and grandfather, plying the Caribbean for Red Snapper in a tiny rowboat. There's Mariella, his younger wife, who is dying to leave for the U.S., but feels bound to Cuba by her three children. There's also Pita's best friend, Michelle, and Mariella's brother, Roilan, both, both of whom have each tried and failed to float to Florida many times. So to talk more about this remarkable film and how it was made, today we're fortunate to be joined in studio by the film's director, Kim Hopkins. Kim, uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you talk to us. If you would, how did you decide to come to make this documentary? Um, I think like most things I do in some ways by accident, um, a film I was uh, uh, working on had just collapsed and I was looking for another film. And um, back in the late 90s I um, worked in Cuba um, in the Cuban film school um, in fact I started I co-founded the documentary department in the Cuban film school and I flitted backwards and forwards from the UK to Cuba for about four years so I got to see kind of Cuba um, kind of as a tourist doesn't see Cuba and so there are four central characters in this film I think kind of the main character is this 30-something year old woman named Mariella. Mm. She's married to Pita, an older fisherman. How does she, I mean, tell us how she feels about life in Cuba. Uh, Mariella is um, uh, frustrated, I, it is, uh, I would say, is not a big enough word. I mean, Mariella dreams of a... I'm not sure if she dreams of a, a better life for herself, necessarily. In some ways, even though she's only in her early 30s, she kind of almost sees her life as, as kind of gone, that her, her time has gone. But she, she kind of hopes for a better life for her children. She's got actually four children. And she's, it seems like she's, like, terrified at the prospect that they will become fishermen too and have the exact same yeah, I, lives I, of the people around them. Yeah, I mean, f fishing for a subsistence fisherman in Cuba is a very, very tough life. Peter, her husband, who's about 20 years her senior, I mean, he rows out to sea every day and it's two hours out to the Kays and two hours back. Um, usually without ice, so he has to row back pretty quick to get the fish back in before they kind of rot under the Caribbean sun. And so Mariella, she 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 does, you know, she desperately wants to go to the United States, even though her first husband died trying to, and she herself has tried before to get to the U.S. and failed. Which I find amazing. I mean, that's a very strong urge. I mean, uh, nine years ago... Um, the father of her two eldest children, the two boys, the two eldest boys, who are uh, 14 and I think 12. Um, and their father, they were very young, I think they were two and, and four at the time. Um, and their father wanted to go to the US on a legal boat. Um, he wanted to take Mariella and the children with him. And she just didn't want to do that then. She thought the children were too young. Um, but 
um, and he he perished along with 29 other Cubans on the way. And they got hit by Hurricane Ivan. Um, they tried to go the long route. Cajo Beach is on the southern side of the island, so it's a longer route round. Um, so there are two routes. You either go all the way around Cuba and either go into Mexico and up up, up uh, South America and in through Mexico, or you go across the island and go from the north coast. But they went the long way around um, and they, they perished. Well, talk to us about her husband, Peter, her second husband then. It seems like he's kind of a revered figure in this poor little mm-hmm. fishing village, Cajio beach uh he's one of the few people and he's all i mean what's interesting he's one of the few people in the film in this little village who isn't desperate to get out Mm -hmm. and peter's a very interesting character he's a to excuse the pun he's a big fish in a very small pond he's a big man in cayo beach um and he kind of he, he he really cherishes his community. He he sees it. He knows what he has, um, and I think because in the um, in the he lost most of his family in the Marielle boat lift in the in the eighties. I think that was in the eighties, um, and um, he knows what happened to his family that did reach America. Um, and he just doesn't buy in to the American dream. And many of his family members were unhappy in America after they left. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, as as people do, some people succeed and lots of people don't succeed. And ordinary working class Cuban or an ordinary working class white American, ordinary working class Latina, you know, it's, a, it's tough. Um, but for Cubans, you know, they don't necessarily see it like that, a lot of them. They think the American dream is, you know, it's still there. Well, this film was shot a couple of years ago when the U.S. still had this, it was called the wet foot, dry foot policy. Uh, Remind us, uh, remind us what that policy was and how that affected Uh, Cubans. The wet foot, dry foot policy, basically as it stood a couple of years ago, was started in uh, started in 1996. Basically, what it meant, and it's, it's unique to Cubans, um, that uh, any Cuban that reaches dry land, um, American soil, um, dry foot, uh, um, can get fast track residency, and then eventually they can they, they can then get citizenship. Um, but any Cuban that is apprehended at sea, either by the Cuban Coast Guard or by the American Coast Guard, classed as wet foot, um, they get repatriated to Cuba. And so the moment that you touch dry land, you're eligible f- to become a legal permanent resident, or at least to begin the process. If you don't make it to land, you can be sent back to Cuba, either by the Cuban Coast Guard or by the American That's Coast correct. Guard. More, well, more or less. We'll take just a moment there to remind our our listeners that they're tuned into Global Journalist. If you're just joining us on today's program, we're talking about the lives of the poor in modern Cuba, as depicted by a remarkable new documentary called Voices of the Sea. The film was screened at the True False Film Festival in Missouri in March and will be featured on PBS's documentary strand POV in the fall. With us in the studio talking about the film is its director, Kim Hopkins. And Kim, give us, if you would, just a little bit more of a snapshot of what living conditions are like for people in this village that you spent so much time in. Um, uh, For a filmmaker, in some ways, you're kind of thinking this is amazingly beautiful because it's, you know, it's just full of patina. Things are worn out. Um, you know, 50s American cars, old Russian trucks shipping water around, uh, a lack of drinking water. Um, you have to repair everything. Um, and Cubans are amazing and inventive. They will make everything work. I mean, for example, they would take a, a, a uh, um, deodorant bottle and they would turn it into a light switch. They would just be able to spin the top and 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 turn it into a light switch um and basically they throw nothing away absolutely nothing um life's really really tough there very little public transport um and very frequent power cuts and even more power cuts since there's been an increase in tourism and people there are the people in your documentary are extremely 
critical of the Cuban government. Cuba is known for having a very repressive media environment. So how were you able to get access to the people that you documented? What, what were your interactions with the Cuban government? Um, well, what, to get access? Um, well, I, I got access by my work with the Cuban Film School. Um, I, I got paid very poorly because there's not a lot of money um, and I did quite a lot of work for the school and they kind of owed me um, and, they, and they asked me to do a, a workshop in, in, uh, in 2014 late 2014 and I said I would do it but I wanted kind of something back and that was I wanted to get access to this fishing village um, and uh, um, Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Well, you said you would do the workshop if you get access to this fishing village. Yeah. Uh, they were able to grant you that. But I understand that yeah. also you had some issues with the Cuban military at, at some point. Well, we, we, had, we had some issues with the, the Cuban authorities. We were, we, because we lived in the village, we lived, uh, which is illegal. Uh, there are, you can only live in, in, in certified areas in Cuba as a foreigner. Um, and Cahill Beach wasn't one of them. And so we were renting illegally a house um, and we were kind of embedding with the people in the village. And after about 10 weeks of filming, the, the Cuban military came in and unceremoniously kicked us out. They basically gave us four hours to get out of the village. So we had to kind of decamp and operate from further away um, and travel in every day. They, were, they, were, they didn't even look at our material. They were, they were kind of bothered about that we were living in the village and that we were getting too close to the to the people in the village um and uh, and as i said we would then have to travel in every day which is on on cuban roads is pretty difficult well we mentioned at the top of the show about th this film is built around four main characters mm -hmm. and we talked about mariella uh, the younger wife uh, pita the older fisherman uh there's another character in the film named Michel. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also a fisherman. He's Peter's best friend. He's made multiple attempts to get to the United States. And I think some of the most amazing footage in this film is that you actually, I understand, gave him a camera and he videotaped his raft, uh, an aborted raft trip to try to get to Florida. Tell, mm -hmm. tell us about that. Well, um, we, we, as we kind of embedded ourselves in this village, we we began to realise just how endemic this this was that Cubans wanted to get out. Um, they were trying to because there was some interaction between uh, President Obama and the Cuban government, and and the 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 press were saying Cuba was opening up, and that you know things were kind of you know looking up for for the for the cubans ordinary cubans but the cubans didn't see it like that the cubans basically saw it as that the cuban state was going to repress them even more because the um, the american government was not going to in, uh, exert that that political pressure on, on them anymore um and so there was a kind of mass exodus basically of of uh, of cubans during that period and in part because there were fears that this wet foot dry foot policy may go away which was this special exemption for Cubans, where if you made it that, to the US, right. you could stay, unlike people from many other so countries. So they wanted to get in before that door closed. Yeah, um, and uh, and within a within a week of us filming there, um, Mariella's brother Royland, he he um, decided to to make another attempt to leave. He tried twenty times before, um, and on the twenty first occasion, whilst we were there, he went again and he succeeded in in reaching Florida. But he didn't tell us that he was going to go. He didn't trust us. Um, whereas Michelle, when he decided to go, which was later in the shoot, we had gained enough trust then and he informed us that he was going to make his attempt, which is amazing, really, because um, the Cuban... He's telling you he's going to do something illegal. Something incredibly illegal and something that would put him into prison for a long period of time because he was the tillerman on the boat. Um, um, because fishermen know the sea, and so they get employed as Israel, um, and they don't have, they don't have to pay. They probably wouldn't better afford to go anyway. Costs around about four hundred dollars per passenger, and there's about twenty twenty five 
people on a boat. That's kind of the mass that gets a boat from Cuba to Florida. Um, uh, $400 for a Cuban fisherman, really hard to come by. Um, but they get to go free if they steer the boat. But that makes them kind of part of the organisation party, you know. So the person who builds the boat and the person who finances the boat and the people who steer the boat are regarded as people traffickers. And that's a big prison sentence for them. Um, and, uh, and so when, when Michel revealed to us that he was going to make an attempt, um, we, we, we thought we couldn't get a consensus from these 20 or 25 people. There's no way they were going to let us get on the boat and film. And we thought, how can we cover this story? Um, and then we decided to ask Michelle to film his own story, a bit, a bit like kind of people's journalism. Um, and we procured a camera on the island because we didn't want it to get traced back to us, um, because we then may be accused of aiding and abetting people trafficking. Um, and, and so we kind of taught him the kind of usual stuff, to keep the camera wide, don't do lots of zooms, make sure you film yourself. And he did a remarkable job, an absolutely remarkable job of covering his vo uh, his attempted uh, escape. And it was extraordinarily dramatic because the engine on the boat broke down That's halfway across. It seemed like halfway between Cuba and the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so the people on the boat started trying to row. And you had some fantastic footage of them actually taking the engine apart and throwing the pieces overboard. Mm -hmm. um, it just it, it was it was incredibly dramatic. And ultimately, they were relieved to be captured by the U.S. Coast Guard instead of by the Cuban authorities. Tell us tell us what the difference is and how people are treated if they were caught by the U.S. versus the Cuban authorities. Well, they they bobbed around in the Florida Straits for around about eight days, and they were running out of of water and food, um, and. Um, they were they the first thing that the Cubans do is they want to get out of Cuban territorial waters because if they're caught by the Cuban um, uh, Coast Guard the, the penalties are more severe um, than if they get into international waters when the the US Coast Guard might pick them up um, and they got they eventually after around about eight days got picked up by the US Coast Guard and they were repatriated back to Cuba. Um, basically what happens is they, they kind of sit on the US Coast Guard vessel for a few days as they wait to see if they pick any more Cubans coming um, and then they get repatriated, they get held um, by the Cuban military for a while, de debriefed to try and find out who who organized the trip. Usually the Cubans are pretty good at keeping silent on that. Um, and then after a few days, they're sent back. Um, and, and as I said, so Michelle wasn't fingered as being somebody who was part of the organizing. Um, and so he was sent sent back to Cayo Beach. Um, but he was he was fishing on a state boat. Um, and though there is supposedly not no punishment, um, uh, um, the, you become kind of persona non grata. You just can't get work from then on. And so what do you do? You have to go again. So he lost his job on a government-owned fishing boat then? That's good. We'll, we'll take a moment just to remind our listeners that they're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, we're talking about life in modern Cuba as depicted in the new documentary, Voices of the Sea. The film follows the lives of four people living in the tiny and poor fishing village of Cayo Beach and the effect on their lives of the promise of escape to the United States. If you're interested in more Global Journalists, check us out online at globaljournalist.org. There you can find our archives and additional coverage of underreported international news and human rights issues. You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, or see our video cast on YouTube. Uh, and one thing that I wanted to talk about as well, Kim Hopkins, mm -hmm. is that one of, the, one of the things that I enjoyed in the film was that there was a lot of nuance to it. And you really showed how the one main character, Peta, was almost alone in his village in being content with his life there. And one of the ways that was illustrated was that one day he spent the day documenting the name of every single person that came to his kitchen. Tell us, tell us a bit about about that. I think in some ways we as filmmakers kind of 
instigated this thought. I, th I think it was such a natural thing for Peter to have his community pouring in through his house every day. He didn't even notice. It wasn't until we said, you have loads of people coming into your house every day, that he picked up a piece of paper one day and he wrote the names down of everybody that came into his kitchen. And there's 56 people walked in through his kitchen in a single day, of which he gave coffee to most of them. And so this is sort of the counterpoint to he has this young wife who has ambitions, especially for her children that she sees are never going to be fulfilled living in this tiny fishing village in Cuba. So she's saying, get me out of here, get me out of here. I'll leave. I'll bring the children at some point in the future. And he's saying, but look, look at what we have here. I have 56 people coming into my kitchen every day. Like I will never have such a rich community again in another place. Um, so I, I, I really thought that was like an important, an important point, an important aspect that was brought out there. Um, but one thing that was heartbreaking was to see that even though there's this closely knit community, so many people are trying to take off at this moment of time. And it seems they often don't even tell each other. People just vanish from the film and vanish from each other's lives to make this journey to the U.S. Well, in Cuba, it's a very, very sophisticated surveillance system. They have had, you know, nearly six decades of practicing um, and even in a small village like Cayo Beach I don't know, population around 300 they're, even they do not know who the informers are You said even in a very small village people there wouldn't know who the informers are and that's why people would just disappear I was asking about why people would disappear sort of without telling their neighbours or friends but Because they didn't trust anybody they didn't trust anybody It would get if it got back to the, the authorities or the police or the military mm. they would get arrested so you know, the, basically they don't trust anybody they don't trust their next door neighbours usually because they don't know for sure who the informers are well, just to get back to the story in the film, we talked about Peter's best friend, Michel, the, the, guy, the fisherman who you gave the camera to, who documented his attempted crossing, and he later got picked up by the U.S. Coast Guard after eight days adrift. He tries a second time in your film to get to the United States. Uh, tell, us, tell us what happened to him then. Well, uh, a few months later, obviously, he's now kind of persona non grata. He's not able to get work. And him and his wife got another opportunity to go. Um, and they, they just disappeared. They didn't tell anybody. They, um, they didn't even tell Peter and Mariella. The best um, friends. The best friends. They just, I think they must have got an opportunity that happened quite quickly and off they went. And nothing was known about uh, what had happened to them. Um, and the Cubans know kind of more or less how long it takes to get to, to, to Florida. Um, and they'd been gone missing for a, a little bit too long a time and the village was starting to get worried. And then a new story broke in Florida that a group of Cubans had landed on a lighthouse just off the Florida Keys. Um, and this kind of news story had been swirling around and it got back into Cayo Beach and they wondered if Michelle and Estrella were involved in this story. Um, and they, they, they managed to contact us in, um, back in the UK um, to see if we'd seen the news story and we checked it out and sure enough, we recognised them, they were there, they were on top of this, this lighthouse. And so they landed at this lighthouse, which is actually out to sea, it's not actually on land, so they it, were still... Were they wet foot or were they dry foot? What what happened to them? Well, there is a precedent of, a, of um, uh, I think it's the Seven Mile Island Bridge. A bunch of Cubans, kind of a couple of decades ago, had hit that bridge and it was broken from the mainland, um, and they were classed as not being that they were classed as not getting reaching dry land because there was a break in the bridge. They were on one of the concrete piles. Um, and they, they got repatriated to Cuba, and then on appeal, they actually got back into the US. Um, they were classed as dry foot. So this, when the, the Michelle and Estrella and that group of Cubans um, were eventually talked down off the lighthouse, um, and then they were held on a Coast Guard, American Coast Guard cutter. They, because they couldn't take them to America because that would be dry land. So they just kind of float them around in a floating prison for a while until they decide what to do with them. And eventually they were on that for six weeks and, um, and eventually the judge ruled against them. Um, I'm sure that it went against them because of the politics of the time of the kind of new detente between America and Cuba. And so they ended up getting taken to Guantanamo Bay, the U.S. naval base, 
in Cuba and staying there for some time. So they, so they, uh, they didn't know kind of what to do with them. They, they, the Cubans accused the Coast Guard of maltreatment. Um, and uh, while there was kind of an inquiry about the maltreatment or w w whether or not they, they could verify that, um, they were held in Guantanamo Naval Base for a year. And then ultimately they uh, and received then they, refugee status. And then they ended up getting refugee status, and they're now in Brisbane, Australia. In Australia. Well, uh, let's finish tying the knot then about the other, a couple of the other characters. Then Roy Lan, the brother of Mariella, uh, you mentioned he's the one who had made 20 on his 21st attempt to get to the U.S. He finally makes it. And so how, do we, how does he feel about being there once he's there? Well, Royland, as as most Cubans do, he went to Florida, stayed in Florida for a little while, and eventually found himself in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, he's a fisherman, and there's not a lot of sea in Phoenix, Arizona. He's in the desert, and Royland is he. After two, we we followed his story for a couple of years, and he 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 was struggling. He hadn't learned any English really. He, um, he was mixing just with the Latin Latino community or with the few Cubans that are in Phoenix, and he was working cleaning garbage up at the side of the road, earning about eight bucks an hour, something like that, and missing his family terribly. And his only kind of contact with his family was, was uh, very expensive phone calls. Um, and he kind of was lamenting his decision. Well, Mariella, the main character, the one who so desperately wanted to go to the United States, ultimately she's diagnosed with stage three cervical cancer at the end of the film. And I think at that point she seems to sort of accept, I'm never going to get there in my life. Is here. Talk to us about how how the film ends. Well, that's one of those kind of plot twists that that documentary makers have to deal with. Uh, you know, we, that was something that we just didn't see coming at all. Um, and I think there's nothing like serious illness to reevaluate what's important in your life. And I think once Mariella had got diagnosed with that, a if she had gone to America and was in her brother's situation, I don't know what her health care would have been like. But in Cuba, she does get free health care, um, and she is is hoping to get uh, a, an operation for her cervical cancer. Um, and she basically. As uh, I don't, you know, there's a certain contentedness with what her life is now. She's realised that she's not going to come to America, um, and that she's going to try and build a future there on in Cayo Beach. And we do have just a few a uh, few seconds left. But if you could tell us what what do you know that has happened to these characters' lives since you left them? A year well, and a half well, ago? Roy Land is now. I think the latest I heard is working for a, a window company. So he's more or less in the same situation. Still hasn't got housing, living in a trailer park. Um, Mariella still hasn't had an operation yet. She's still a year later, still not. And um, Peter is still going out fishing with his bad back, rowing out for two hours a day um, and taking fish and coffee for the doctors to try and press to get Mariella's operation done. Well, Kim Hopkins, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. We're out of time for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism, KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Kim Hopkins for joining us and to the True Faults Film Festival for aiding production. Our producer this week is Maria Fernanda Calleon, and our visual editor is Juwan Choi. Aaron Hay is audio engineer. Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.